Welcome to On The Spot, where Angie, our producer, asks us questions and we have no idea what's coming. Welcome back to On The Spot, guys. Well, thanks for having us, Angie. <laughs> Listen, I've got a great one. I'm putting you on the spot with a topic today, and here's how we're going to start. I love these episodes. I know, I know. I just feel like you could either talk about khakis or zebras. Like, you don't know where we're going. No idea. Okay, so here's, we're going to start with a game. A game? Yes. This is my favorite. Ben loves a game. Okay, so we're going to, I'm asking you, is this scenario that I'm about to describe, we're going to go through several scenarios, right or wrong? Mm, Ethical dilemma. Yes, it's ethical dilemmas in ministry. I can go ahead and tell you right now, Lindley's not going to be in the middle on any of these. Okay. <laughs> she right. doesn't have middle ground. It's Is either right too? or wrong. No, I have middle ground. Whatever. Okay, well, I want to say this. Can you say something nice about me? You look great in that outfit today. Thank you. <laughs> it took you a minute to get to the word outfit. Yeah, because we actually he... had a disagreement about this this morning. <laughs> yeah. Every time she wears this jumpsuit, I say, hey, I'm going to change the oil today. Can you get to it? <laughs> <laughs> and it really bothers her because I really, I cannot look at this outfit and not see like the 1975 full service pump. Hey, I would like us to go back to the full service pump. I just would say I would pay a little extra for somebody to pump my gas. You know, Thank I'm you. glad this is happening in the show right now because people are wanting to hear about this. Okay, so say something <laughs> really nice. I think it's so amazing how clear you are in your thinking about topics such as this. I right, thank you. I mean, Landon Dowden was so nice about his wife's personality. You know what? He's <laughs> godlier than me. It's so true. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, here we go. Right or wrong for uh, ministry leaders? Okay. Okay. Venting to a friend about your staff. Ooh. We can't qualify this. Actually, I think it's okay if you want to unpack it a little. Yeah. I think this one's really hard because mm-hmm. it's probably wrong, and we probably should take it straight to the Lord, like mm-hmm. the Bible says. Yeah. But sometimes, I mean, you just have to find a friend and say, "I got to tell you about a story," yes. and it's just really upsetting me. And it's, I'm sure it's wrong. If I have to answer, I say it's wrong. You have to answer. This if I have to choose one of those two, because nine times out of ten, I feel rotten about it later. Hmm. And I've always liked the saying that, you know, fun is fun the next day after you do it. Mm. And Mm. those conversations, I don't tend to look back and think, I'm really glad I aired all my dirty laundry about this person in my own version Mm -hmm. while I was emotional about it and never went back to clean it up. When would you say it'd be right to talk about a situation? In a counseling situation? Mm Mm-hmm. Where there's a person that's not attending the church, it has no connection to the person, who also is trained to hear bias. Mm. Uh, our friends tend to accentuate how we already feel. And sometimes what we really need is someone to balance. That's probably why I went to that friend, by the way, because mm. I knew they would vote for me. Oh. So that's why I'd say it's wrong. Okay, next. Celebrating the 4th of July in church. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What are your thoughts, Ben? I would first and foremost say, I have always appreciated knowing who's been in the military. Yeah. Like, it always amazes me. Like, I didn't know you served in the military. Like, it gives me a glimpse of people's story. Like, even today, there was a guy here. He was like, we just hired him. I was like, hey, how do you stay in such good shape? He's strong. He's like, I was in the military. Hmm. Hmm. Like, there's a story there. So when we would, in our first church, we would have, you know, the whole song where all the branches of the military stand up. Wait, are you talking about Memorial Day or Fourth of July? No, Fourth of July. Okay. I couldn't remember. Uh, Salute to the armed forces. Salute to the armed forces. I always looked around and thought, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that. Having said that, I do think it can feel really awkward when we're in church singing the national anthem. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't feel right to me. Even though I love the national anthem at a football game, it feels weird in a church service. How come? Because I feel like it, if you really read the Bible, like God is the God of all the nations. So, you know, we should sing every anthem (laughs) if we're going to sing one because God loves them all the same. But people will say, but you're living in America. I know. And that's why I love those people, because a lot of those people fought for our country, and they, they see it differently because they live through a different era. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Lindley? 
Oh, man. I, I'm not going to go black or white here just because, I, gr- I mean, I agree with everything you said in that it, people who are passionate about something, it's because they come from it comes from personal experience. And so I think, like you said, they're passionate about it because they've lived through it. Um, I do also think that it could it, – we're not celebrating our country. It, it, you know, when we're at church, I'm there to celebrate God. So that I do get a little bit torn in it and that I feel like, well, what about the people who are from different countries mm. in that service as well? So – it's a local church issue because it's contextual. If you have a church right outside an Air Force base, like it would be weird to not recognize the significance of that day. So I think this is one of those places where we need to give people a lot of room to apply that in the context in the way it feels appropriate. Okay, next. For ministry leaders, is it right or wrong to keep your life private? Wrong. Why? Well, I just think personally, I mean, the, the feedback that we get even from the glass house is people will say, I can't believe you're so vulnerable. And I think that we're missing out on that. I think keeping everything private, we're missing out on saying, why should we not all be vulnerable? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're all broken. That's the gospel we preach and believe in. And so it, why pretend that everything's fine if it's not fine? We're not helping. We're not helping anybody to feel like they're not crazy when they're having some hard hard times. I was thinking the other day about the passage where it says, in all these things, these other stories, if they had been added, there would be no end of the books. So there's so much that didn't make the Bible, the mm-hmm. cut of the Bible that I wish had, mm-hmm. but for the space, I know it couldn't. But I, I don't think the Bible helps me on a day when I have sat around and pouted all day and didn't do the laundry. Like I was like I told my wife I would. Because there's not a chapter where Paul says, and by the way, on this day, I was really angry at Barnabas for his view on John Mark. So I just sat around and ate all day and I was angry and I did not wash my clothes. <laughs> if there was a paragraph like that, I would feel so much closer to Paul because I have had those feelings. So the Bible doesn't give us a lot of glimpses of like that side of humanity. So I think it is the pastor's job to show people that I am struggling to apply the very thing I preach appropriately. I don't want to hear his memoir every Sunday. Yes. I don't want to hear about his kids every Sunday. I don't want to hear about how great they are. I I do occasionally want to hear how this message ran through the, the mess of his life and how much he needed it that Sunday. I think appropriateness is the right word. Um, when I say wrong, black and white, I mean that and that there has to be some privacy. I mean, I I love being inside our home because it's one of our only private places. We don't often even post anything on social media from inside of our home because I kind of want it to be our space um, so that people don't know and can't have opinions on how we decorate or what we own or anything like that. So I think there are some reasons to be private, but I think there's also a lot if you're in a in a position of leadership to where you can have moments of vulnerability, I think it's important. Good. Next. Sabbatical. Right or wrong? Gosh, I think that goes to almost like healthy versus unhealthy. Mm. We never had a sabbatical. I mean, Ben was in ministry for 17 years. I think that's a more recent thing. So, I mean, it is definitely something that's more recent as we've seen more and more burnout. Churches have recognized the need for a break for a pastor. Where it's wrong is when the pastor doesn't realize that all those people out there didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> so when he comes back from his sabbatical, which the whole church wonders, what did he do that whole time? And, and talks about how he finally got his wind back. You have a guy out there that's been running a small business and working 75 hours a week you know, pulling in 75 grand a year and wondering how, what would it be like to work at a place where I could take four weeks off and just read about my business? So I think you have to be very careful on how you articulate what a sabbatical is to people who don't understand it. And it could even injure them. Paul said, you know, if my eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. So in some ways you have to think about sabbatical that way. Mm. If my taking sabbatical is going to make half my church stumble, 
maybe there's another way for me to get some rest. Hmm. Maybe I'm here on Sunday, but I'm okay letting somebody else preach. And a lot of that has to do with timing, too. If you're brand new to the church and you're asking for sabbatical, that's wrong. So some of it has a sense of, okay, I've been here long enough. People know I've, I've suffered greatly for this church, mm-hmm. and they want me to take a break. It's very different than forcing it. Hmm. I was with some friends recently, and she was telling me about her work situation. She's in medical profession, and she gets 26 days, I think it was 26 or 24 days, 26 days a year, which at first I was like, wow, that's great. And then you start to think through Christmas and Thanksgiving and all those things. I mean, it's really not a ton of time because there are no weekend breaks. There are no um, holidays. You know, she doesn't get off for Labor Day and Memorial Day and all those things that we can take for granted. I mean, especially in the church, it's, you know, we talk about how it's 24-hour job, seven days a week, but there are some times of flexibility, which is so helpful. So I think that, you know, preaching to that my friend out there, that's hard. Biblically speaking, you can see how God builds rest into the rhythm of the Jewish life, obviously in creation. So the idea of taking an extended rest is a very biblical thing. How it's applied is the key. But you're not saying it's wrong. Like it's right. It's, it's fine. right to rest. Yeah. I think that's where you have to involve other people as leaders in the church to ask, is this the right time? Is this the right thing? How will this be perceived? Rather than just say, I've been here X number of years. I need sabbatical. Okay. Overeating and not exercising, right or wrong? Wrong. Well, that's I mean, an easy one. That's wrong. And I violate that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love to eat and hate to exercise. You got lucky genes up until this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but according to Lifeway Research, about 70% of pastors surveyed said, I don't feel good about my body. That affects your preaching, it affects your leadership, it affects your self image. It affects your sense of respect for yourself. Uh, so if you aren't taking care of yourself, eventually you're going to pay that bill. And that's what Lindley stays on me about, and she should. It's more your health. It's not, I mean, for me, I'm like, hey, at 47, I'm not interested in appearance after 22 years of marriage. I mean, I am, of course, but I'm interested in your health. I want you to be here. And I think it's, you know, there's so many things in Scripture that we hold the line on, but there is there is quite a bit in Scripture about your physical health and gluttony and some of those things. So, you know, why do we not hold the line on that in the Christian life, too? And I think the other side of this equation that we need to talk about is that this is not body shaming in any way. Like, different people have different size-shaped bodies. Right. It's how the person is obviously taking care of themselves or lack thereof Right. that causes a credibility issue. I mean, some people are just big people. But they work really hard to be the weight they are. Uh, So anytime we give the impression that we've just let ourselves go or we're not concerned about our own physical appearance, I think we lose a a lot of ground with the people we serve. Right or wrong for ministry leaders, tweeting an opinion about someone else. Wrong. I think it's wrong because I've I've never seen it bring good. Mm Mm-hmm. It always feels good as soon as you hit go, but it doesn't take long to feel like that may have not been the the best way to deal with that. And, you know, a gentle answer turns away wrath. In social media, very little of it is gentle. It's terrible most of the time. Even very innocent reels. We love to watch reels, and sometimes there's just innocent ones about a dog or something, and people get on there and be like, can't believe you treat your dog that way. And I'm like, it's a dog video. Like... Who has this much time to comment on everybody's stuff? And I just question the effectiveness of it more than anything. It's, okay, maybe there's something I really need to speak to. This is a big deal. I would be a coward not to speak to this. I still question whether that microphone is the best microphone. Versus just what, going. What are the available channels or relationships I could leverage to have this conversation rather than try to have it in a public forum where people have way too much time on their hands to cast judgment? It just, to me, it has, it has made conflict resolution harder, not easier. Posting about a nice vacation, right or wrong? <sighs> All of these are neither right nor wrong. They're situational. <laughs> They're nuanced. I mean, I, 
I think church members are wrong to judge a ministry leader who who knows how long they've saved up for that vacation. Who knows if somebody gifted them that vacation. Right. And yet I also think the ministry leader needs to understand that people are going to make judgment on appearances and without the full context, this is not a helpful post. I think a maturity maturity is helping younger staff especially realize that you can take that great vacation and not post about it. It really happened. <laughs> even without posting about it. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, we've told the story before about when my dad gifted us a car and somebody got on there and said, oh, pastor's wife has shiny new wheels. And they had no idea that it was essentially a gift. Um, and you can't walk around and you can't post like, this is a really great vacation. And please know that we received this money from somebody else. Um but I also feel like going back to the being happy for other people, we just we talked about that on the episode with Kathy and Ed Litton. Why can't we be happy for someone if they went on a vacation? Like, why can't we say, man, that pastor and his family, they work like a dog all the time. And I'm glad they had this moment. And I'm glad to see the pictures because that makes me want to go there. I want to push back a little bit. When somebody sends me a text message that they just went on this cool vacation, I feel so included. Like, oh, cool. Thanks for sharing that. And then I hop on social media and they already posted it. It makes me feel like I was part of some kind of marketing deal. <laughs> Whereas if they just sent it to me, it's like, oh, this is a connection. You thought of me. Like, that's a really neat thing. But when somebody posts it, now it's like, I wanted you to know, but I also want the world to know. There's something about that that feels wrong to me. It makes me feel slighted. Kind of like when Ananias okay. and Sapphira <laughs> said that they were going to sell this field and give all the money to the church. And they really only gave a portion of the money to the church, but they wanted people to believe they gave all of it. There's something about the way we share pictures that can be just kind of deceptive. People are putting out their highlight reel. Yes. Yeah. But I think everybody understands that too. Just, You're way more protective over social media channels than I am. Why is that? I just feel like you sound jealous. <laughs> Sorry. I like mean, jealous because I'm seeing them at Disney World and I want to be there? Maybe, or jealous because somebody else is as important to them as you. You know, they shared it on their social media because maybe they have a family member that doesn't. Well, I guess they wouldn't have a social media if they didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> but I'm not jealous if, if my friend texts me a picture from some cruises and I'm like, I'm really happy for him. That's awesome. But that's a channel that's a trusted channel where there is no pretense. When, you, when he puts that on social media, I, I just feel like that's braggy. Okay, so what about when we record an episode and we post it in our social media story versus sending it to someone and saying, hey, I think that you might enjoy this message. Well, I feel like you and I have a lot of hard conversations about that. I feel like on channels like this, in order for it to grow, you have to self-promote. I, I actually talked to our books team once, and they're like, we really love authors that self-promote. And I'm like, really? Because they're really proud of their material. They're really proud of their content. They want the whole world to experience the joy of what they've discovered. But for me and my personality, my conscience is, is very troubled whenever I am posting something that I feel like is pointing people to me. I'm not saying that's wrong for everybody. It feels wrong for me. What if you have a good message? What if the Lord gave you a good message? That felt a little Jesus jukey. <laughs> well, you've been kind of juking the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the spot with Ben and Lily. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Is it right or wrong for ministry leaders to tell someone they do a great job when you actually have no idea what they do? Mm. I, I think it's wrong because it's a lie. Yeah, it's insincere. I mean, I think that with everybody, you can find s sincere words if you want to praise them. But you don't have to find insincere. I, that Flattery is just a real... I, I don't like flattery. Over the years, I've... I've really changed the way I say things because I don't like the way I feel when it's over. So when I tell somebody, hey, praying for you, I do not say that anymore unless I literally know I'm going to pray for the person or I pray for them right there. 
Because now we're taking something that's very serious in Scripture and turning it into just kind of some kind of greeting card thing. So I try to say, like, okay, maybe I don't know they're doing a great job, but I can say this. You know, I always love the way I feel around you. You bring so much energy in the room. Or, man, you make, you make every project that I'm involved with way more fun. Mm-hmm. That doesn't speak to their performance. That doesn't undercut the, the knees of their boss who's on them about competence. It just says, I experience positivity when I'm around you. So I think leaders over time learn how to say things in a specific way without, without violating their own conscience. Yeah, it's like it comes from a place of wanting to encourage, but it's actually communicating something that they don't even know if it's true or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what's hard for me is like as a leader of a company, people relate to me differently than they do their peers or those who report to them. So all I can speak to is the way that I feel when we relate. But sometimes I'll get wind that this person is actually very difficult to deal with. And it surprises me because I've never had any problems. Well, it's because people relate up down uh, differently than they relate down or laterally. So over time, I think we learn to be careful uh, to not send a message that's not consistent with the overall performance of a leader. That's good. Is it right or wrong to relate differently up versus down? It's absolutely wrong, but we're all flawed human beings, and we all do it. Oh, right. I mean, I know. I'm just... Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to impress their boss. So they're going to say things a little softer, a little more kind than they would to somebody who works laterally or, you know, in a direct report position. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, Is the office of pastor a powerful position? 100% it is. It's influence. And what you say is taken seriously because you represent, you're speaking on behalf of God. And just by nature of the kind of work that you do, people expect you to be an authority. So pastors do have an enormous amount of power in shaping the way people think about a certain subject, which is why we have real challenges on social media because a pastor speaks to his church in his context about a very specific issue, and then it goes out publicly, and the public does not have the context. And they, that pastor has to pull that video down because he never meant to say all that. He was just saying this to his people. That shows the power of the position right there and how people are affected by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would you say? I'm interested in your thoughts. Is it supposed to be powerful? I don't, I don't know if it's supposed to be or not. I think it is, um, and I think it's unfortunate sometimes because it's just a man in a position that comes with a lot of clout or i mean people put you on a pedestal i had no pastor recently that did some dancing on stage just being silly (laughs) i saw it and i thought that is so human i love it i had no idea he would ever do that well he got a vicious uh message on social media that he was not regarding the sacred desk Hmm with its proper authority. Hmm. And to this person, they felt like this is very serious work and you're making light of it. Hmm. Whereas from my perspective, I thought, isn't it wonderful that people can see that a pastor used to be in a dance club? Yeah. (laughs) I just find that interesting about him. Yeah. So I, different people that based on their experiences interpret the power of the pastorate Uniquely. So when we moved out to Denver, one of the hardest things for my ego was that people in Denver just do not care if you're a pastor. It's not impressive to them. Hmm. They almost pity you. So the way I say it is when I was... avoid you. They'd avoid you. Yeah. When I was in Tennessee, if I got pulled over by a cop, I'd try to make make them know somehow that I'm a pastor. (laughs) In Denver, the speed of the the ticket goes up twice. Wow. Um, I'm exaggerating. But there really is no sense of respect for the office of pastor. Hmm. Which has all of Which uh, I, I loved that blessings and curses. Yeah, I loved that. Mm-hmm. What's great about it is they really treat you like you're just another guy. Like you can relax. You're not always on. Well, you were always just Ben. Yeah. There was no brother Ben. There was no pastor mm-hmm. Ben. There was no doctor in Mandrell. I mean, it was just Ben. Nobody cared. There was no title. That didn't matter. But with that. Anytime I walked into a school to try to get a contract to meet for worship, they treated me like I was just another guy. Yeah. Whereas in Tennessee, oh, there's a pastor here. I don't know if that's true anymore. Well, maybe not not anymore, but it was back then. Yeah. I mean, maybe 15 years ago, but 
so the respect for the pastoral office comes with, I think, blessings and curses. Mm-hmm. That's good. Okay. Y'all have done great. Last one. You ready? Okay. Is it right or wrong for ministry leaders to complain about their jobs? It's right if you're complaining to the right people. Say more. Everybody, every human being needs someone to say, I had the worst day at my job today and I would love to quit. Mm. That's just real. But you can't say that from the pulpit and you can't say it in your Sunday school class and you can't say it in a context where people would take that as, I hate the people I serve. Mm. (laughs) Or they're such a nuisance to me. I mean, when Moses said, Lord, these stiff-necked people, he said that to God, not to them. Um, But there are moments when you want to complain about your work because you want someone to empathize with you about how work is hard. Mm. I think the word complain is hard. Yeah, that's true. I think that's the the semantics there in that to tell some honest – well, I mean, honest feelings is even a tricky term because our feelings honest. But to say how you feel to someone to express, you know, a a meeting that went bad, a coworker that – was rude to you that kind of thing i think to just say it as in this was a really hard day and i need to tell you about my side of this story is different than like man i hate my job and so and so you know I, it's the way you express your feelings i think does that make sense no i do think and there's scripture that says do, do everything without complaining or grumbling so right. yeah complaining is a problematic word mm-hmm. the authentic side of that is admirable you're being real but there should be a sense in which if we're called to God's work, it's a privilege. Mm. And we are honored. I don't know if you saw in the U.S. Open this year, they made a big deal out of that saying that the pressure is the privilege. Mm-hmm. About how all these players talk about how much pressure it is. And I think it was Billie Jean King that said that. But somebody said the pressure is a privilege. Mm. So, yeah, it is a lot of pressure. But how many people in the world get to come out on this court and enjoy this work? So keep that in mind before you talk about how much pressure it is. And I think I think lay people sometimes feel that about pastoral people in pastoral ministry. Like, yeah, it's a lot of pressure, but you're doing God's work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so there should always be a sense of hopefulness about it or a spirit of positivity. Excitement, that, even yeah, in some like, ways. I can't believe I get to do this. Those are the people in ministry that, that endure because mm. they never lose the joy of it. Good job, guys. That was really good. Thank you. I, um, I want to say all of these questions are rooted in kind of a sin. I'm just going to use the word sin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they could be translated as gossip, secrecy, entitlement, gluttony, slander, wastefulness, judging, lying, fakeness, power hungry, all of these things. But what you're saying is that they're all very nuanced conversations and things that ministry leaders really deal with on a regular basis. There's one thing I noticed in all of your answers that they had in common. Do you want to guess what it was? Mm-mm. What is it? It's the heart behind yeah. the issue. The motives. It's the motives. Yeah, these ethical, ethical questions, right or wrong, are difficult. Like, is it wrong to lie? Yes. If you were in the Holocaust and you're hiding a Jew. Right. Uh, you know, is it is it wrong to keep a secret? Sometimes. Mm-hmm. If it's the wrong information. Yeah. So I just want to recognize that mm-hmm. this is where the, the difference between knowledge and wisdom in the Bible. Knowledge is having all the information. Wisdom is knowing how to use it. Mm-hmm. And there have been times when I have spoken, when I shouldn't have spoken, when I've not spoken, when I should have. Like, there's always that ethical dilemma of, did I do the right thing? And that, I heard someone say this recently. The, the hardest part about being a leader is that you bear the weight of being wrong. So every night when you lay down to sleep, you have to ask yourself the question, did I use this influence well? Was I right or was I wrong? It's a heavy burden Mm -hmm. to carry. I think I loved hearing your summary of all the things because, like we said, even how, you know, the on the spots are simply mine and Ben's opinion. Yeah. And the listener will probably disagree with half of what we said, and that's okay. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it, there, it has there has to be some room for disagreement, besides what comes from the Bible. Yeah, let's let's play a little game with you. 
Me? Yeah, you ready? Oh, okay. Is it right or wrong to spend two hours uh, a day on social media? It, what if your job is in social media? Exactly. <laughs> I would say it's wrong because you probably need to be spending eight hours in social media. Is it is it good or is it best? Is it okay or is it better? Best. Good or better? Like best, I, yeah. yeah. Is it right or wrong to watch an incredible story on a movie that in, that includes a lot of profanity? <laughs> See, these are yes. really hard questions. I know what you like hard questions. Well, I do because there are moments like even with our own kids, like, man, I really want them to understand the story of what happened here rather than watch some lightweight movie with no story that has zero profanity. Mm. It's just an ethical dilemma. Yeah. Because I want them exposed mm-hmm. to the great stories, the great ideas, but with that comes challenges. Mm-hmm. So, in all of this, there must be wisdom. I mean, God has to help us through all of our decision making because it's so hard today to know what to do. The Glass House is brought to you by Lifeway. It is produced and edited by Angie Elkins with help from William Hall. Sound engineering by Donnie Gordon. Artwork by Heather Brzezinski. And photography by Rebecca McVeigh.